Let's say I get in a relationship with you because I think you need me. I can make your life better. I can make a good impression on you. I can lift you up out of your situation. What happens if all of a sudden it's obvious you don't really need that? You don't need lifted up out of your situation. Or let's say that you actually do go from being in kind of a, a down position and you get your act together. And all of a sudden, you got things, you know, firing on all cylinders, and you're working well. I, I lose my sense of value. I lose my sense of you needing me. I all of a sudden have a fear of abandonment. Wait, you don't need me. Why would you leave? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Lonely Podcast. In this episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Robert Glover. Dr. Glover is the author of the best-selling books No More Mr. Nice Guy and Dating Essentials for Men. He has a PhD in family and marriage therapy and has helped numerous people around the world for the last 40 years of his career. This was a super interesting conversation and we have tried to cover a lot of grounds in 90 minutes, which was a bit challenging, but I think we did a pretty good job. We talked about what is the Mr. Nice Guy syndrome, how can you identify yourself as a nice guy, what are covert contracts and how nice guy use them in relationships, why seeking the approval of women is inevitably detrimental for oneself, how establishing strong relationship with other men is key, the path for changing oneself and recovery from the nice guy syndrome, dating, sex, and much more. As I mentioned during our conversation, the book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, had a considerable impact over my personal life. And though written over 20 years ago, I think it is extremely relevant today. Finally, this is not the last time I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Robert Glover. So if you have any questions or subjects that you think we should cover more deeply in the next session, please comment and send us an email, podsolitude at gmail.com. And now, without further ado, please welcome the incredible, the amazing, the ambitious, the inspiring Dr. Robert Glover. Okay, Dr. Glover, thank you so much for coming. For the invitation, it's good to be here. Yeah, same. Very, very happy and very excited to be speaking with you. Um, well, I see book. my book back yeah. over the corner. There you I go. Like there you go. I, I, I thought I was doing gratuitous selfie <laughs> and all that promotion. There, you got my book back there. That works. Oh, of course, that's uh, part of the part of the thing here. You know, uh, this book had such a tremendous impact on my life. I wanted to have. You know, I think it can impact so many other people, and so, um, so that's why I wanted to talk to you. Let's start with kind of uh, definitions. Obviously, uh, just again, I read your book actually multiple times. I read it again in preparation for this conversation. So, <clears throat> but I think it's really important for those who don't know what we are talking about to actually start with explaining what exactly we are talking about. So, who is Mr. Nice Guy? All right, good question. Good place to start. Yeah, the nice guy is a person who believes he's not okay just as he is. And, and, and there's usually two factors to that. One is he thinks he has to become what he thinks other people want him to be, to be liked and loved, to get his needs met, and hide anything about him that might cause people to respond negatively to him, to reject him, get angry, hurt him. And usually the things that nice guys, at least the men I work with, hide the most are their needs, their wants, and their sexuality. And, and it's like, I have to keep those hidden from people because if people knew I had needs, wants, uh, perverted sexual wishes, you know, they would think badly of me. And for I think the majority of the men I work with, these belief systems got internalized at a really early age. I, I mean, few weeks, few months, few years old. They inaccurately internalized um, the experiences that they were having as children, as infants, with, it, with their parents, with family, with society, with culture, as they weren't good enough. There's something wrong with them. So I, I better become good, and I better hide any badness about me. And then that gets really solidified during adolescence, when we get interested in the opposite sex, whatever the opposite sex might be to us, 
and then into young adulthood is pretty well entrenched in the way we go about choosing a mate, choosing career, how we interact with people uh, in general, in the workplace. And so it, it, it's those two key things. Because there's something wrong with me, I have to become good, uh, avoid conflict, get other people's approval, and hide anything about me that might get a negative response. Got it. And, you know, I think as uh, the kids like to say today, uh, probably Mr. Nice Guy is a spectrum, you know? So spectrum. I'm sure, yeah, it's on a spectrum. Like you have guys that are, like I, I know from personal experience, right? I read the book and I thought, oh, there are some character, characteristics here that I really identify with, right. some that I'm not identify with that much. So you can, so I guess the question is this, when do you know, if, if we assume that everyone has some sort of, can identify with some of those characteristics, when do you know that you have a problem with that? All right. That, yeah, that reminds me of like uh, when I took psychology 101 and then later on, you know, a few years later, it might have been even in grad school where I, where I took, you know, a course on, on diagnosing, you know, personality disorders, mental disorders. And I remember in psychology 101, the professor saying, as you start reading about, you know, basically people with problems, you're going to see things in there that you go, I do that, I have that, I think that way, I feel that way. And all of a sudden you start self-diagnosing it. I've got all of these you know, disorders. And, and the truth is, uh, we don't. You're right, it's all on a spectrum. And well, let me say this one thing about nice guys first. Let me break it down a little bit and see if, I can, if that helps answer your question even further. When I started working with men that that self-identified as nice guys. I did too. I, I, I used to say, I'm one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. How come everybody doesn't like me? How come everybody doesn't, you know, have the same life roadmap paradigm that I do of trying to be generous and treat people well and treat them like I want to be treated and, and all those kinds of things. And when I started working with other men as uh, my trainings in marriage and family therapy, uh, so they would come in alone or with their girlfriend or wife and say, I'm the nicest guy. I'm a nice guy. I'm one of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. I treat my wife, my girlfriend well. I treat her better than her ex. I'm raising her kids. I give her everything she wants. It's never enough, never happy, never wants to have sex anymore. She's angry all the time. I go, well, I can finish their sentences for you. And I thought maybe at first all nice guys were the same, kind of, you know, one, one size fits all. And what I thought was maybe they're all like me is that, well, you know, we, you know, we avoid conflict, we keep the peace, we think we're great. And why doesn't everybody else treat us and appreciate us for being so great? And I came, as I began working with, with a lot of men who identified as nice guys, I found there's also a second category of nice guys. I call this first category the I'm so good nice guy. And that is, uh, I, I say that nice guy syndrome is ba basically built on a foundation of, of shame and anxiety. And so that shame is, I'm not okay, I'm not good enough. But the I'm so good nice guy has that totally repressed. I mean, that's me. I, I remember my second marriage uh, to the woman I was married to when I wrote No More Mr. Nice Guy. She'd be reading me like John Bradshaw's The Shame That, that, that binds, you, binds Us. And she'd go, this is you. And she'd read these things about shame. I couldn't even relate to it. I didn't even know, I, I, you know, I'm a smart enough guy. I already had a PhD in marriage and family therapy at the time. And, and I couldn't relate to the concept of shame or even that I felt shame. Now, later on, a lot of men told me after reading No More Mr. Nice Guy, I really like how well you explain shame. So I guess I did come to understand it. But as the I'm so good nice guy, my shame was so pressed down that I wasn't even aware of it. Now, it still drove my need to be seen as good, right? And do everything right and drove my need to hide anything about me that might get a negative reaction. Why would you do that if you didn't have shame, i.e., I'm bad, I'm not good, I'm not lovable? And so that's the I'm so good nice guy. The other one is what I call the I'm so bad nice guy. This is typically the guy that just fucked everything up as a kid, as a young adult, often that a, a diagnosed or undiagnosed ADHD. You know, they, they, they were impulsive, they ended up in the principal's office, they couldn't listen, they couldn't pay attention, they couldn't sit still, they made bad grades, they got into fights, just all that kind of stuff. Maybe started drinking and drugging at an early age, maybe were rebellious, oppositional, defiant, all that kind of stuff. And then maybe at some, and so their shame is all right up here. I've always been, you know, 
such a messed up person. And then later in life, uh, something happens. They find religion, they go in the military, they get married, they have a kid, you know, a near-death experience. Something happens and they go, I got to clean my life. up." So they become nice guys. Now, the I'm so bad nice guy, their shame is right up next to the surface. They think it's just a matter of time till anybody that gets close to them finds out just how defective and unlovable and messed up they are. So we've got these two types of, of nice guys. The one who's, you know, both are trying to be nice guys. One is pretty unconscious of that they're trying to be a nice guy and they don't really understand why. The other is much more conscious of trying to be a nice guy because they think it's the only alternative to being kind of the perpetual fuck up that they, they were since since childhood, right? And they, they know why, their shame's right up here. So guys are gonna fall, if, if they identify as nice guys, and this applies to women too. I mean, there were nice girls probably long before there were nice guys. So somewhere on that spectrum is usually the, the pretty common behaviors of seeking approval, avoiding conflict, hiding things about ourselves, um, trying to get things right, maybe being perfectionistic, uh, maybe never taking a risk because we're afraid if we don't do it perfect. Uh, and it can show up more in relationship, more show up more in the workplace. Uh, maybe some guys never live with any purpose and passion, but they're they're more integrated in relationship. And most nice most nice guys tend to be. It shows up most in the personal relationship, you know, especially with the opposite sex, the approval seeking, the validation, and and those kind of things. And maybe they go to work, and they're just you know they're total badass. They get things done. So not everybody can relate to every dynamic of nice guy sex. Yeah, isn't the I'm too good, I'm too bad. It's kind of the same. Because the, the same. I'm too good, I'm too good guy is uh, saying I'm too good, but deep down, does this person really feel that they're that good deep down? Well, like I think a, that a... it's like, oh, I'm so nice. That's why I'm going to camouflage my character. I'm going to mask up because if anyone finds out, then that's going to destroy me. They're going to realize that I'm so bad, actually. Well, here's, here's the problem with your que the question. The problem with the question is you're, you're assuming that I'm so good, nice guy is self-aware and introspective. Okay. And, and, <laughs> and as I said, I wasn't. I, I really thought I'm, I'm, I'm a good guy. You know, I don't yeah. think people bad. I don't lie. I, I, I was comparing myself to my father. Who, who, who could be kind of a, a narcissistic, moody, controlling asshole. And all the bad men I'd heard, starting with my mother, all the women complained about all the bad men out there who only wanted one thing, is sex, and they used... And I thought, I don't do that. And I wasn't introspective enough to even know, why do I try so hard to be nice? I, I kind of just thought I was, you know? And I, I never thought I tried to hide stuff, but... For example, when I started going to therapy or joined a men's group, I realized I, I don't like revealing myself. This makes me uncomfortable. When I would like play a sport or want to learn something new, I'd never go hire a coach. I'd never go put myself in a situation that made me look like I don't already know what I'm doing. Right? It was only in those contexts I began to realize, oh, what is it I'm afraid of? Well, I'm afraid of being seen. And what is it I'm afraid of being seen is that I'm not perfect. I'm not good enough. Now, all of that was pretty unconscious for me until I started being confronted um, with the reality that my nice guy paradigm wasn't serving me and made me anything but very nice. So it took me a while to actually get that kind of self-awareness. I understand. So uh, I would say that... Uh... If I understand you correctly, basically those two manifest themselves on a kind of a, um, like on the superficial level, they manifest themselves differently. Like what I feel without, without being self-aware of what I'm actually, what actually is the issue here. But on the underneath, it's, it's, it, it stems from similar places. Yeah. Well, it, but what's funny is that on the surface, you know, if you and I bumped into, quote, a nice guy and say we had no, no idea of this paradigm of nice guy, yeah. um, we would probably think they were both pretty the same. 
you know, I'm so bad, nice guy. Mm -hmm. I'm so because because they were both kind and generous and caring. What we wouldn't realize until we like maybe got into a, maybe a men's group with, with both of them. Mm -hmm. the I'm so bad, nice guy would start out just telling you how bad he was, all the things they'd done. I, I've been an addict. I, I stole. I, I was always in trouble. They would they would they would lead with that. The I'm so good, nice guy would kind of go. I, I I don't know why my wife won't quit bitching at me. <laughs> it's kind of like yeah. it's all about her. You know, if yeah. she could change, I'd be happy because I'm okay, right? Mm. That you'd see the difference right away of of how they portrayed themselves and how they believed themselves to be, right? Mm -hmm. I'm so bad, nice guy really does believe he's terrible. He's messed up. The I'm so good, nice guy really does believe. I do everything right. How come I don't get mm. enough appreciation and validation? And, and how come I don't get the same back that I give? And would think, it's everybody else that's the problem, not me. Yeah. And believe me, that was my view of the world. <laughs> and, <I got> out, <laughs> and it does show up every now and then still. It, it creeps up. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely like to ask you about, about how it shows up later. Um, kind I'm of to dive to in, into it. into that, but there's a, a do you know that there's another book that I've read um, by Dennis Prager. It's called Happiness is a Serious Problem. I have it right here, and there is I don't know that book. This one. So, okay. to be fair, there's a lot of like it, this book kind of provides like an overview, or explain of you know, talks about happiness, why happiness is so important. The title, A Serious Problem, it's kind of um, implies that happiness is your obligation, sort of, meaning okay. you ought to be happy. If you are unhappy, but I'm, I'm giving you that from like a 30,000 foot view, <laughs> if you are unhappy, it impacts not just you, but all the people around you. And here's how uh, you can identify the source of your unhappiness and, and your source of, un of happiness. Okay. So, but that's a long intro here, just to say there's a point on this book, and you talk about it as well. It talks about uh, victims get sympathy, and I would yeah. love to hear kind of your thoughts about it and how it's related to the nice guy. Um, so I'm quoting from the book here. It says, defining oneself as a victim is comforting for another reason. Victims get, or they think they get, sympathy. Regarding oneself as a victim is therefore quite a powerful t temptation. We get to blame others to our unhappiness, for unhappiness, and receive other sympathy. What a great deal. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, three th at least three things come to mind. Let's see if I can hold all of those in my thought. N n number one, I, I, I was reading something uh, a little while back, and kind of like a daily meditation. And, and, and this, this person said that kind of being the victim gives us an illusion of control. It, it sounds kind of odd, but, but kind of like if we can just create the structure and order of why this is happening to me, it's their fault. I'm being treated bad. It, it, it kind of gives us some illusion of control. It's not. There is no control there. It's an illusion. A second thing that it does is we don't have to take any accountability. It's their fault. You know, I'm unhappy. You know, as, as you're saying, we're accountable for our own happiness. And, and, but if we can blame it on somebody else, we don't have to do anything that scares us, that gets us out of our comfort zone, that requires us to take personal accountability. It is, it's, it's a cop-out. It's an easy cop-out. Well, it's their fault I'm not happy. You know, I'm, I'm a victim. And one of the things I tell people, um, you can actually be victimized without being a victim. You know, you know, things happen to people all the time. Some people take the victim path. Other people go, well... Uh, that, that sucks. How am I going to overcome it? How am I going to deal with it? And they, they move on with their life, right? But the that part that's why it's seductive. I I I'm a, I'm a theory. I don't know if there's any way to test it, but my, it's an evolutionary theory. And that is, I suspect, you know, back in our, you know when we're hunters and gatherers, and somebody in the tribe got hurt. I expect if they got hurt, you know, if there's a woman, you know, that was pregnant, childbirth, you know, whatever. That required extra attention and extra resources. And I think that probably felt good because this was a, you know, hunters and gatherers. We, they didn't have, you know, an abundance of resources. You usually just whatever you hunted and gathered that day. And so if somebody was sick, 
hurt, vulnerable. We gave them extra attention, extra time, extra resources, and that felt good. You know, that, that was kind of nice. Hey, I got more to eat than everybody else. I got a lot of, you know, personal attention. That feels good. Now, I suspect back in tribal times, that only lasted for so long until the person who was victimized actually became a burden to the tribe. And then they're probably, either, you know, you know, slap, slap out, you know, snap out of it, or maybe even just left behind. You know, you're a burden. We, we can't keep backing you along. So the same thing happens today. Whether is somebody else giving us extra attention or resources because we got hurt, victimized, done to, whatever, or we're doing it to ourselves, you know, having our own little emotional for me or, or you know, getting a lot of mileage out of telling our story. It works for a little while, both when we do it with ourselves and with other people. People, oh, that's too bad. That's terrible that happened to you, blah, blah, blah. And then after a while, they go, get over it. We're tired of hearing about it. We're moving on. You, know, you can stay there if you want, but we're going on without you. So I think there is probably some evolutionary payoff for being a victim for a short amount of time. Long amount of time, it probably uh, really works against the, the person basically playing the victim card. You know, um, Dr. God Saad, he's an evolutionary uh, psychologist. Interesting guy from Canada, funny guy as well. I think he talks about what you're saying. Uh, and he also talks about the phenomenon that he calls the uh, Munchausen by proxy. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I don't know this very well. <laughs> Maybe you do yeah. better than me. I've heard, but... I've heard of it, but don't ask me to explain it. Either. Yeah, so he, he has says that not only that being a victim is beneficial for you in, to some extent and for a limited amount of time, but being related to someone who's a victim, meaning if yeah. your child is sick, yeah. if your spouse, then you get the sympathy of everyone else without, like, just because you're you know, in proximity to this person. And he said that in some times you have parents who would intentionally hurt their children to Poison achieve that. their kids. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, 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 let's run with that for a minute, but let's okay. shift it a little bit. Okay. You know, in No More Mr. Nice Guy, when, when I wrote the book, I, I caught, I, and, I, and I wrote it 25 years ago. So it's been a while. Yeah. I consciously did not use the word codependent or codependency in the book. And that was a conscious decision. And, and you know, people will ask me, well, Robert, what's the difference between nice guy syndrome and codependency? I go, they're the same thing. Yeah, I just didn't use the term. Because mainly at that time, the only time you heard codependency talked about was using one of two contexts. One was uh, family members, close, people close to addicts. That's where the mm -hmm. term, I think, probably originated, was like a partner of a, an alcoholic, a drug addict. And it kind of evolved where you, you, you know, a number of books were written for women on codependency. But nobody had ever addressed codependency in men that, as far as I could really see, not directly. When I, when I set out, you know, writing, no one was a nice guy. It probably began writing 30 years ago. But codependency, nice guy syndrome are, are the same. Another term for codependency that I like that actually is to me a more descriptive term is called borrowed function. And that means I only exist. I only have value. I only have identity in terms of like another person or some event or, you know, something outside of me. It's a borrowed function. So it's like, for example, I remember when uh, years ago I had a Weimariner. A dog with long floppy ears that, you know, everybody loves, you know, Weimariners are so cute and kind of, you know, different looking. And, and everybody would, oh, you have such a beautiful dog, blah, blah, blah. And that made me feel really good. That borrowed functioning. It, it, it actually gave me no value, but no money in my bank account. But, you know, people, you know, loved my dog, so I, that's borrowed function. Now, what happens in relationships built on borrowed function, you have to have the, 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 the fixer, the enabler, you know, the, the knight in shining armor, and you have to have a victim. You have to have somebody who's broken. You have to have somebody who's needy, somebody that can't take care of themselves. Now, those roles are usually chosen not because they're real. It's because the roles usually we're familiar playing. Most victims are used to playing a victim role. You know, most rescuers are used to playing a, a, a rescuer role. Now, I, in my book, I borrowed this from codependency, uh, other writers before me. 
to talk about the victim triangle or codependent triangle, where you tend to, in these, in these systems that depend on borrowed function, you go through the role of being like the fixer, the, 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 the rescuer, rescued, and, and the perpetrator, some version of that. You know, the, the, the fixer, the person needs fixing, and then you alternate through being, you know, the, the perpetrator. So while I'm, you know, oh, I think you need my help. I'm going to help you. And then you don't appreciate me. I don't get back what I invested. I had then become passive aggressive or angry or resentful. And I do hurtful things or I, I leave you or I call you names. And then I feel bad about doing that. So I go back to rescuing again till all, all circles around. So it makes sense in relationships where there's borrowed function. Let's say I get in a relationship with you because I think you need me. I can make your life better. I can make a good impression on you. I can lift you up out of your situation. What happens if all of a sudden it's obvious you don't really need that? You don't need lifted up out of your situation. Or let's say that you actually do go from being in kind of a, a down position and you get your act together. And all of a sudden you got things, you know, firing on all cylinders and you're working well. I, I lose my sense of value. I lose my sense of you needing me. I all of a sudden have a fear of abandonment. Well, if you don't need me, why would you leave? It's kind of that, 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 that disorder you're talking about. If my kid actually gets healthy, it isn't sick anymore, I don't get attention. I better keep them sick. That's borrowed functioning in a very sick way. But codependency is really just as sick. I need to keep you dependent, needy, you know, uh, not, you know, whatever, struggling, because I need to see you that way, so you'll need me because that's the only way I know how to exist in a relationship. So breaking that pattern in a relationship of this, you know, victim, rescuer, you know, borrowed functioning, uh, it can be challenging because it, it disrupts the whole foundation that, that, that a lot of relationships are built on. Yeah, this is such a profound point, really. I'm sure a lot of people can identify with that, either from their side or from their partner's side. Um, that does you know some someone some some relationship are not very balanced and someone is playing like more of a leader leadership role in the relationship and you know the the relationship depends on this person staying in that role basically exactly and and, and, and it, it depends on the person who needs fixed or help yes, or, yeah. it, it, they got to stay that way cuz yeah. if if they if they don't it messes everything up yeah that is so profound, really. Um, okay, I want to ask you why my next, the next step is kind of why is Mr. Nice Guy? Meaning what is the origin of Mr. Nice Guy? And for that, I would like to kind of be more specific here because I think that one of the things is, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you mentioned in the book, you talk about kind of the baby boomer generations sons that did not have great relationships with their dads obviously the one the fathers went to fight the great war the sons often protested against the vietnam war and was kind of a crisis in america at least and i would argue around the world as well the western world and in addition to that you have the feminist movement that all of a sudden started you know, saying uh, there, there's a lot of things coming, a lot of great things coming from the feminist movement, obviously, but a lot of things coming in kind of an accusatory um, way towards men in general. Uh, men are bad, etc. Today, and again, it's interesting to ask you this because you wrote this book 25 years ago. How it's so relevant still today. Today, I, I would argue that this has become much more radicalized than it used to be. Well, you have the um, uh, Me Too movement, you have this uh, radical feminism, you have this victimization, victimization phenomena that exists so much in the US, social media, dating apps, all those things. Um, is Mr. Nice Guy, from your observation, is more prevalent today than it used to be? And, and, and if you can attribute, if you can, was I, was I, Am I on point here in terms of my diagnosis? <laughs> Does it make sense? You've shared a lot of valid points. Let, let me, um, okay. it's a good question. Let, let me back us up and talk about a little, just a little bit more generally at first around, around yeah. just child development in general. 
Uh, yep. Because again, you know, my background's in marriage and family therapy, and it involved a fair amount of child development study along the way. And every child coming into the world is is helpless, vulnerable, immature. Of course, we all get that. Humans are the longest to mature animal out there. Now, for you or my grandparents, our grandfathers probably matured at about 12 or 14. You know, they had to get out there and, and, and work, support the family. I, I matured maybe in my early 20s. <laughs> Nowadays, young men mature in their mid-30s, you know. They, oh, I got to leave home now? So, um, but we're slow maturing. Now, so when a child comes into the world, they're completely vulnerable. They, they can't protect themselves. They can't get their needs met. They're, they're completely needy and dependent on their caregivers, whether that's mother, father, others, whoever's in the picture. And children are also by nature narcissistic. And, and the thinking reasoning part of their brain doesn't start coming online till a few years after birth and doesn't finish coming online in men till about 25 years old. And, but the fight, flight, freeze, the survival part of our brains, the emotional part of our brain is completely functioning at birth. So chi children by nature are narcissistic. The world revolves around them. And they believe they are the cause of everything that happens to them. So when a child has any kind of painful experience, frightening experience, uncomfortable experience, could be they're cold and nobody puts a blanket around them, or they have a tummy ache and nobody burps them, or their their diaper's messy and nobody changes them. And maybe maybe worse, maybe they're they're hit, maybe they're neglected, maybe they're screamed at, maybe there's addicts all around them. You know, it can go from just I didn't get my needs met quickly to I was abused and violated and traumatized. Children do two things at a very primitive level, meaning that because their, their reasoning brains aren't developed, they do this at an emotional level because their emotional brain is. One thing is they try to soothe or medicate the uncomfortable feelings they're having. They may cry. They may sleep. They may eat a lot. They may smile a lot. They may not cry. They may suck their thumb. I sucked my thumb until I started kindergarten. They, maybe I had some uncomfortable you know, stuff. Uh, that was my way of nurturing and, and soothing myself. All children will find ways to deal with their discomfort. The second, and, and, but they do it on a very, like I say, very primitive level. The second thing that all children try to do is they try to prevent the situations that created those uncomfortable feelings from happening again. Again, without a reasoning thinking brain, just an emotional brain. And so all human babies do these two things. How do I not feel so bad in the moment? How do I not, and they're not actually asking themselves those questions. It's just instinctive, reflexive. How do I, how do I prevent this from happening again? Every human baby then brings that through childhood, through adolescence, into adulthood, but we don't know those two things are at work. Of we're trying to not feel bad now and try to prevent bad feelings in the future. And, and we don't really know how to do that because it wasn't really our fault that, you know, we got hurt or felt bad in the first place, but we thought it was. Okay. So everybody does that. Now, nice guy syndrome is just one way of trying to do that thing, of trying to make me feel better right now and prevent those painful feelings from happening in the future. Being oppositionally defiant is another way. Being a perfectionist is another way. Getting depressed is another way. Becoming an addict is another way. There's, and you know, and all, a lot of these can overlap with each other. So nice guy syndrome is just one of many ways of trying to manage uncomfortable feelings, and, and especially as it relates to myself as a person. Now, if we have other dynamics that are also beginning to shape that as a child develops, in my case, you know, I, 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 my father, I had, I had a good connection with him in many ways, but I learned to walk on eggshells because you never knew what mood he was going to be in or how he was going to be critical. My mother used us four children to be her confidant and listen to her complaint about my father. And so I grew up you know, trying, trying to not be like that bad man, trying to be good to my mom, be the good guy that she wanted me to be. Um, then I did grow up during the angry feminisms of the 60s and 70s. You know, uh, every man's a rapist and erection's a sign of aggression. You know, there's some pretty ang angry, you know, stuff. 
Now, I, I thought maybe all women felt that way about men. I came to realize much, much later when I actually met some feminists that weren't angry, and, and they go, no, that was just a few pissed off women, but they were loud, and they, and they printed bumper stickers, you know. And so I, I, I remember seeing that, you know, that, that you know, every, every man's a rapist. I saw those on bumper stickers. Um, so that uh, that influenced me. And then, of course, I, you know, as an adolescent boy, I listened to girls complain about the jerks that they were all in love with, you know. Well, I can't be like the jerk, you know, but I would missed the point that they were actually in love with the jerk. Uh, they never fell in love with me, um, but I miss that point. So, yeah, I think for a lot of, of, of men in my generation, I just, I just turned 68 uh, back in December. Um, I'm, I'm tail end of baby boom. Yeah, I think Vietnam had a big effect. Fathers out of the home had a big effect. Big effect. Rise of divorce had a big effect. Um, just changing uh, social mores, feminism, birth control pill. A lot of things had a big effect. Now, here's what's interesting to answer your question. Is it, do I see it more important than now? I remember about, it's been actually six years ago, I went back to New York and, and, and read, reread basically the audio version of No More Mr. Nice Guy. They originally had a, a professional voice to it. And then after several years, I told my agent, I want to do it. And they oh, gave me I a love contract. it, by the way. Thank it's you. So well, good. They gave me, they gave me a contract. They paid me well. They said, come to New York. We'll pay your way. And we'll give you a big advance. I go, okay, I guess that was a good idea to say, I want to do it. <laughs> but as I was reading it, my point was reading it even just six years ago. And I probably not had sat and read it for 20 years. You know, I, it took me so long to write it. You know, I, I didn't pick it up and read it for a long time. Um, so, yes, I think the book is still relevant. And nowadays when I hear younger men, you know, the, the millennials, you know, the generations that, that are even younger than that. My son is 38. And and uh, my my granddaughter just turned 17. Um, she, 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 she sent me a message about a year ago. She says, says, Grandpa, guess what? I'm dating a guy and his parents are reading your book. And I go, how cool hmm. is that? That my book is even influencing the generation of boys that are going to date my granddaughter. That actually made me feel really good. Um, but here's what I hear now from a lot of, of, of guys, you know, men in their 30s and 20s. Not that, oh, yeah, yeah, there's still the divorce that affects families. But what I hear a lot more is guys saying, my dad was a nice guy. You know, he, he didn't live up to his potential. You know, he wouldn't take a stand on anything. The basic message he gave me about life was don't piss off your mother. Because he was walking on eggshells, trying not to piss off my mother. And if we pissed her off, he had to hear about it. He couldn't stand up to her. And I thought, well, that's pretty true. Because my son, my stepson, grew up with a nice guy father. And they're 38 years old. So that is a big difference I see. Now, yeah, throw the whole, we're revisiting angry feminism again. You know, toxic masculinity. You know, all, all that projection on the men, as you say, hashtag Me Too movement. Um, and where, you know, a lot of men I work with, I, I don't want to risk making a mistake. I don't want to tell a girl I like her. I don't want to kiss her. I don't want to do this because I might get accused of something. Now, here's at least my thought. I think, you know, most social changes happen with pendulum swings. You know, we, we, we needed feminism. Well, you know, when we had a patriarchal system and, and women were, you know, being submissive and, and you know, were dependent on men and the men could do whatever they wanted. I still, I live in Mexico. I live in a macho culture where, you know, where the men still do whatever they want, you know, and, and the women actually support them, uh, which is kind of funny because the culture is built around mothers raising their sons and daughters to be that way. It's kind of interesting dynamic. So what happens is we needed something, but it's, it just swang, you know, really far this way. But I actually think the pendulum is starting to level out to where we're kind of getting past everything's toxic masculine, everything is, you know, hashtag me too, everything men do is evil. And, you know, there's, there's men's programs out there, there's men's groups, and most of them are around about being conscious men, you know, men of integrity. Um, and, and, and I just don't hear quite the angry vibe that you did just you know, four or five years ago, directed at, at men. Now, I don't know how things will keep swinging, but I'm actually, I'm very optimistic that, that culturally we're moving in a direction that is um, supportive, you know, 
of all peoples, you know, supportive of women, men, you know, whatever, you know, whatever variations any of us, you know, uh, are manifesting is, is kind of like, it's okay. It's all right. And, and I don't, I don't see quite the venom, um, that, that I did a few years ago. Now, I don't watch the news. I don't read the news. I'm not on social media. So maybe it's all still out there. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I just don't, but I, I don't, I don't hear quite as much about it. Got it. Yeah. I, you know, it's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think a lot of the things that at least I used to live in San Francisco and I know that you know now there's all the question about gender uh, gender identity especially yeah. at younger age which is a yeah. big issue in San Francisco that's I the think big I, hot, that's the big hot topic I think it's the big hot right topic now. yeah it's yeah. true and I think in San Francisco I saw um like 27% of you know like um teenagers identify as uh, <clears throat> you know a part of the lgbtq uh, community and this uh, this few letters expanded over and over uh, more and yeah, more over the, the time the letters I, keep getting tacked on which, yeah, yeah, which, yeah. you know when, 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 it's going to include everybody at some point right exactly and which kind of is like i i remember seeing this guy this journalist posting something on twitter saying i came out as queer i still date women I'm not dating men, but I'm qu I, I couldn't understand exactly what he's trying to say, but okay, man, like yeah. do whatever. I don't, I don't really care. But it was kind of interesting to me that this guy decided to make a whole I don't know, post about it, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, kind of one of the things that uh, I think this is an, a different struggle because it's not even about being men as toxic it's actually being any like even being a feminine woman it would give you less cred like in the new system of victimization than identifying yourself as a i don't know a day dam a queer or whatever again not to say that there is no legitimacy for some people who actually really identify like that and have uh, issues with that that's that's fine i'm not saying that I'm just saying that it, it seems like uh, in kind of a weird way, the problem maybe have shifted that any binary identity is not as great. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Well, and I, I don't have this all figured out. <laughs> if anybody claims they've yeah. got it all figured out, okay. Um, because I'm, for number one, I'm not in the middle. Of this. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't live. Um, it, it's not surrounding me. But, uh, you know, yeah, I do read about it. And, you know, it's like kind of like my life is simple. I, like I said, I live in Puerto Vallarta. Puerto Vallarta is a very gay friendly community. Yeah. And especially, you know, when I lived in certain parts of it, you know, most of my friends were gay. Most of the people I associated were gay. The restaurants I went to were gay restaurants. You know, I got, I got a hit on a fair amount. And, you know, and, you know, I got, you know, gay men were played. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not drawn to, you know, a gay lifestyle or, or, you know, I'm not gay. Um, but I still have a lot of gay friends. So in some ways, that's kind of really simple. I still have a number of gay friends. You know, just saying, you know, a, a man saying, well, I'm gay. Nowadays, that seems so simple. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, but it's, it's, that used to be out there. But now, you know, that's almost mainstream now to just a guy say I'm gay. Now it's got to get more complicated, right? Yeah. I, this, is, this is an opinion because I don't know. I don't really know. And because I've never lived it, I've never experienced it, I've never had children go through it, but, but two things. One of them goes back to that, um, you know, what gets you extra attention? And, you know, going back to, you know, being victimized can get you extra attention. Sometimes being really smart can get you extra attention. Sometimes, you know, hitting a baseball out of, uh, over the fence gets you extra attention. Most of us like extra attention. And most of us don't get it. And me, and if you don't get extra attention, oftentimes you'll take it in any way you can get it. Good extra attention, bad extra attention. Even like a lot of kids will be bad. They act badly because they get extra attention. Okay, So it is very possible for adolescents who are at their peak of, you know, craving attention. If something gives them attention, well, they, they do it, you know, whether it's, you know, dyeing their hair 
red or blue or getting tattoos or getting piercings or you know saying i'm transgender i'm not trying to you know dismiss anybody's legitimacy to you know to, to being transgender but there's a lot of attention seeking and right now it's the hot topic and so it gets a lot of attention part of it i do blame on the movement in the school system when i was in grad school back in the 1980s and this was part of a feminist influence in, in universities and grad school at that time in my child development courses my teacher said, with, would say, with no scientific backup, they'd say that there is no gender. There is no male-female gender. All children are tabula rasa, blank slates. Gender is a societally imposed, you know, inscription. They get put on, little boys have to be this way, little girls have to be that way. You know, little boys play with trucks and balls and, you know, hit each other with sticks. Little girls, you know, do what they do. Now, there's actually no scientific basis for saying that. In fact, there's plenty of scientific basis to say that little boys and girls in general are very different. In general. Now, is there overlap? Is there exceptions? Of course, there is to everything. And so, but also in that message that there is no gender, that, that it is completely a social construct, they would then also say, and everything that boys do, there's no gender, but everything that boys do is bad, basically. That whole competition of boys is bad, and the cooperation of girls is good. I mean, so anything that had to do with competition got ruled out of school systems. Anything that had to do with cooperation got brought in. So no, there's no individual performance of any kind. So it's all cooperation. Even though they said there's no gender, we're still going to value that what they perceived as the feminine gender. And feminism for there being no gender, they still call themselves feminists. So kind of, I don't know, I just that just hit me one day. And again, this is not to, 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 to bash feminism, but I've got a good friend, a guy who's, who's very feminist, and he teaches in classrooms, I think in the Bay Area, sex ed to little kids that tells them there are as many genders as there are people on the planet. Right? So, you know, if you're already a kid, you know, and everybody gets confused about their sexuality and their sexual preference and, you know, what do I feel like inside my body? Everybody gets confused. And now if all of a sudden you're told, oh, you know, you can pick to be a girl today and pick to be a boy tomorrow. And, and, and all of a sudden, I don't know if that helps. I don't know if that helps when you're confused. I think it's better to say it's normal to be confused. And don't make any major decisions, you know, for the next few years about who you think you are as a person because adolescence is about trying on a lot of things everybody tries on you know kids try on smoking they try on swearing they try on coloring their hair they try on this they try on that that's normal and you know hopefully most people pass through that and come out the other side hopefully being themselves without having to try on anything or be anything other than what they are so I think there's a lot of influences going on with that. And, and, and again, I'm not an expert on it. I don't claim to be an expert. I'm, I'm just voicing some opinions. But that's some of the dynamics I think might be happening. Yeah, I think you're um, spot on, actually. Um, okay. I want to ask you about uh, nice guys in relationships because one of the... That's my specialty. Exactly. So one of the manifestation of being a nice guy comes more often than not in their relationship, as you said before, right. mostly with the opposite sex or can be the same sex as well. Um, can you talk about, um, you know, what are the co covert contracts? It's one of the best, I think, uh, elements in the book that I, I took a lot from and, and why it leads kind of what is it and why it leads to for to resentfulness yeah essentially. I, you know i i agree with you i think that the concept of covert contracts maybe is the most profound thing in the book i i agree uh it, it helps me a lot and it seems to help a lot of people covert contract is is, is basically that it's a, a contract that's unconscious or hidden and i'll i'll even give it a little bit clearer than than i put it in the book 25 plus years ago most nice guys, and, and this is one way you can tell that you might be a nice guy, is do you use these covert contracts? Most nice guys follow three covert contracts, some more than others, but usually all to some degree, and, but 
one or two maybe more profound. First corporate contract is that uh, if I'm a good guy, I'll be liked and loved, and and the women I want to have sex with will want to have sex with me. You know, and that, that's kind of the the that's where it shows up a lot. And you read a lot of blogs nowadays of women writing about you know how nice guys aren't nice in that way. Well, this guy he listened to me, talked about my problems, he helped me out with this. You know, he was kind to me. Then when I didn't want to have sex with him, he treated me like you know I'm just terrible. You know, he, he was abusive. That's a covert contract. If I'm good, if I'm nice, if I'm different than those jerks I hear you complaining about, then you'll like me and love me and, and, and often want to have sex with me. That's not always part of the component, but that's, that is nice guy seduction. I'll be nice and then you'll want to have sex with me. And I'll hide my sexual agenda from you and you'll still want to have sex with me. It's not very bright thinking, but nice guys aren't always that bright in that way. Okay, so it's covert contract number one. They're all if-then propositions. They're all manipulative by nature, they're all unconscious, they're all giving to get, they all have strings attached. So number one, if I'm a good guy, uh, you'll, you'll like me and love me. Number two, two, if I meet your needs without you having to ask, then you will meet my needs without me having to ask. So if I will read your mind and anticipate and do everything that I think that, that you know, you'll like and, and, and make, you know, as, as part of that still borrowed functioning, Thing. Oh, you can't meet your needs. I'll come meet them for you, but then you'll meet my needs. Well, it's a covert contract. It's manipulative. And there's all of these have several problems with them. Number one, just being a good guy, good person doesn't make everybody like you or love you. You know, it'd be nice if it did, but it doesn't. Number two, mind reading other people and trying to anticipate their needs doesn't help them read your mind and even know that they were supposed to be reading your mind to meet. And especially if as a nice guy, you pick somebody who was so dysfunctional at meeting their own needs and somehow they're now going to come meet your needs. I mean, again, that equation doesn't work well either. And the other part of the problem is nice guys are often terrible at letting people meet their needs because then we feel guilty or, you know, we're going to be in trouble or we're doing something wrong or I, I owe you something. So. While we're meeting other people's needs, so they'll meet our needs, we often pick people that can't meet our needs, don't have any idea what our needs are, and if they do try, we don't listen. It's, it's crazy, but I've done all that. Third covert contract is if I do everything right, then I will have a smooth, problem-free life. This is kind of a Peter Panish you know, kind of thing. You know, I I I do it right. You know, I I, I treat you well. I I I don't cheat on you. How how come you still get into bad moods? How come you still this? How come everything doesn't go well? And th this covert contract isn't just in relationship. It can be kind of like with the world in general, with God. God, I'm good. How how come you don't lo you know love me back? How come I still have these problems? How come this didn't go well? How come I got sick or got COVID or she broke up with me or my kid? So the three covert contracts are all fundamentally dysfunctional, but it is the core paradigm of how nice guys go about trying to be liked, loved, get their needs met, and order their world. And when it doesn't work well, most nice guys just double down and try harder, doing more of what already is not working, and then often become resentful, rageful, passive-aggressive, moody, withdrawn, pouting, unavailable, playing the victim card, all that stuff because my covert, I met my side of the covert contract. Now, I'm, 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 I'm the player, the referee, the scorekeeper, <laughs> the judge. I've got the scoreboard up, you know, in, in my, in my living room. I did everything right. You, you know, you didn't give back or you didn't appreciate me or you were in a bad mood. You were, you know, you know, you should be penalized. We want the big referee in the sky to come call a foul, put them in the penalty box because I did everything right. And then, you know, so again, there's that resentment, the victimized, the lashing out, the passive aggressive behavior, which makes nice guys often anything but very nice. Yeah. Uh, in, in that, there's uh, a lot of different elements. One of the elements you speak about a lot is the the ultimate goal of the nice guy is getting approval especially from women and so i guess if you if i can i can ask you why is that a bad thing to get approval for women uh for for a nice <laughs> guy 
<laughs> no, I know, but uh, I, <laughs> I'll luck. tell you a secret. I think I know the answer, but I want to, okay. <laughs> but well, I want you to, to to explain because it's. Uh, I think thing. it's important to to point to note. So you asked me. You asked me why does it make sense, or why why would what's wrong with men trying to get women's approval? And I, and I said, you know, when we're all born, our first caregiver is typically a woman, a mother, or some other, usually female caregiver, and it makes sense that our very survival depends on figuring out how to manage our caregiver, you know, and make sure that they're available and they give us what we need and want. Then for most of us, when we go off to school, I only had one male teacher until I got to junior high. So that meant just even getting from kindergarten to first grade, first grade to second grade. Not only as a little boy, I had to learn my reading, writing, and arithmetic, but how to please a woman. Because, you know, I've got to, I've, I've got to do it right to get to, you know, move on and, and you know get approval so if you think about it for really most human beings our earliest experiences are around needing to learn to negotiate the politics of making a woman happy because our, our well-being depended on it now typically in you know in you know what we might say is you know cultures further back than ours you know where there's masculine initiation this is normal well, you know the little boys grow up you know making mom happy. And then, you know, around adolescence, you know, um, you know there's, of course, there's, there's rituals in Judaism. There's, there's always been rituals and initiation. And so the little boy around adolescence, the men come, take him away from the mother's influence and take him out and, and initiate him into the scary world of the masculine. Now he just primarily hangs out with men and he gets the, the privileges of being the, the adult male. And these, 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 you know, rituals have existed for, you know, for all human history, as far as we can tell. Nowadays, we don't have them, which means nothing breaks that dynamic of a little boy trying to please women. There's no taking them away by the men and giving them a massive initiation where they learn to bond and connect with men and get things done with men and then interact with women from not that place of, oh, I need your approval. Okay, it, it comes from a very different place. So the, the, the real problem is not that we all have that experience growing up. The problem is nothing interrupts it anymore. And one thing that I, I say to a lot of, of, especially the younger men, younger nice guys I work with, I said that they, they're still hanging out in the nursery. They're, they're, they, 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 they pursue lives that require nothing of them. You know, ser searching for stuff on the internet doesn't require anything of you. you know, masturbating to porn on the internet doesn't require anything of you. Playing video games doesn't require any, anything of you. Surfing Netflix doesn't require anything of you. Smoking pot, drinking, you know, hanging out with women that you, you know, don't even show them you're interested in them sexually. It's all hanging out in the nursery because the, the boys have always been sought to, you know, seek feminine approval, which you can't ever really get. There's really no such thing as feminine approval. There is masculine approval. If you in the masculine world, a man tells you, here's what you need to do. All right, you do it, you, you get approved of. You, you know that. In the feminine world, there's never that you know, structure of, if you do this, you'll be approved of. And so that's the problem with seeking the feminine approval. It keeps you in the nursery, and you never actually do attain it because there is no attaining of feminine approval. Approval for men is masculine by nature. It is the approval of women for nice guys um, is basically sex, having sex with women. Is that constitute? That, does that constitute approval? That that is a core approval. Yeah, yeah. If the woman wanted to have sex with with you, because like I, I I took that route. I I had uh, a couple of affairs in previous relationships, much earlier in life. That's actually what started me on the path to to my nice guy recovery. Those affairs had virtually nothing to do with sex for me. It was that a woman approved of me because she wanted to have sex with me. And it was like, how can I turn that down? Now, the sex actually complicated everything. The truth was, oh, she approves of me by, by wanting to have sex with me. Um, so for a lot of nice guys, yes, the, a woman's sexual desire of them is, is the greatest mark of approval. Now, we haven't even talked about nice guys and sexual issues, but often <laughs> nice guys have a lot of issues around sex as well. So actually, you know, 
the, the getting of the sex maybe isn't as simple as that. You know what? I also think another dynamic of feminine approval is the woman's in a good mood or not mad at me. If you know, I'm still that way. You know, if 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 my woman, if my woman, if my wife's in a good mood and not mad at me, I, I'm kind of like, oh, everything's good. You know, she approves of me. But as soon as she's unhappy about anything, bad mood about anything, kind of grumpy or irritable or withdrawn about anything, it's like, oh no, what do I have to do to get her back into a good mood? Um, so I think even the maintenance of a woman's mood can tie into that. Okay, I've got her approval. Everything's okay. Now, I'll throw in one other piece. This is really kind of crazy, but again, nice guys, the things we believe, at least the things I believe as a nice guy are crazy. I used to think that if a woman wanted to talk to me and tell me about her problems, that was approval. Because that's what my mother did. I, I thought I had mom's approval while I sat and listened to her talk about her problems and complain about my dad. That was another key part of my nice guy seduction. I'll listen to a woman talk about her problems and then she'll, she'll like me and approve of me. I found out that women will talk to anybody about their problems. They'll talk to their girlfriends, they'll talk to the checkout person, they'll talk to their cat. It doesn't matter. Just anybody will listen to them talk about their problems. You're not special. Now, it took me a long time to kind of figure that one out. Um, so that's another form of, of nice guys seeking feminine approval. Yeah. So, okay. Um... Let's talk about how how we how we change. I obviously have tons of questions for you, but we have a limited <laughs> amount of time, so we have to move yeah. move on. I'm sorry. Um, Often at the beginning of interviews, I ask the person, "How much time you know have we allowed yeah. for this?" And usually they'll say X amount of time, and I'll go, "It'll take longer." Um, yeah. For some reason, most of my interviews take longer than, than the host thinks. They yeah, because you can talk about it for like. So much time. There's so much to dig into. Um, but I do want to ask you about change and, yeah. and and how you actually go about it. Like, okay, I'm a nice guy. I identify myself. Is that I use covert contracts. I am. Seeking I have all these issues. Yeah. Right. I'm seeking feminine approval. I have all these things. I, I treat myself as a victim. I see myself as a victim. All those things. What do I do? What do you do? Okay. Let me kind of put a little bit of a subtlety out there, because for most nice guys, well, most men, the way, the way men kind of think, we think, well, it's just, you know, identify the problem, get a solution, you know, work the solution, problem solved. Um, that, that's kind of how we approach things. Line up the ones and zeros, the machine will run, and it will keep running. And so guys will say, well, what do I need to do, and how long is this going to take? A few weeks? Uh, I go, hey, I, I've been working on it for 30 years now. Um, so I'm going to share basically what, what I did and what I've seen over the last 30 years, what I've seen work for a, a lot of men. Now, but I want to say this part first. Most nice guys, when they think, okay, being a nice guy isn't a good thing, what do I need to become? I don't want to become the asshole jerk, so maybe I'll become, I'll find a, you know, you know, some middle point between them. And, and, and I'll say, I don't know what the tipping point is between two dysfunctional you know, uh, continuums, as you've said. Is it being the wussy doormat or the asshole jerk? And I think both are just trying to manage anxiety and shame. They just do it in different ways. Nice guy does it by flight freeze. Asshole jerk does it by, by fight. And, but they're just still managing shame and anxiety. So what I tell guys is you don't have to become a different person. You don't have to become a better person. You, you get to be integration. Being an integrated man is being more you, where you accept and integrate all aspects of you all you know we recognize how we were trying to seek other people's approval we look at all the things we were trying to hide from ourselves and from others and rather in, and we embrace those things it's just being part of ourselves and because nice guys don't want any rough edges we want everything smooth but you know humans have rough edges and, and, and that's really okay so we're not trying to become better the nice guys have been trying that all their life we're not trying to become good we're becoming more you. And, and where I think some things that have to happen to do that journey, to go, go down that path, is number one, I tell guys, don't try to do this alone. Because again, that's a nice guy pattern. Just give me a book to read, give me some videos, give me some material, I'll read it. And in my own head, I'll work through my nice guy issues. Doesn't work. I tell guys, you did not become a nice guy in social, social isolation. You won't get over it in social isolation. 
you really have to find safe people, a coach, a therapist, a men's group, a good friend, a priest, rabbi. I began mine in a 12-step group, and then I got a therapist, and then I got into a men's group. And what I started doing was revealing the things about me that I didn't want to reveal, all those things that made me really uncomfortable. And I was doing that in a 12-step group for sex addicts. And I quickly found out I wasn't a sex addict. So I wasn't having enough sex. But it was a great place because I would tell these things about myself that I never told anybody. You know, I grew up fundamental Christian, critical father, angry feminism, trying to do it right. And I just started revealing things. And the biggest reaction I'd get, thanks for sharing, Robert. Nobody was, nobody was freaking out over any, and I'd go tell my female therapist things. She didn't freak out. I'd tell my men's group things. Nobody ever freaked out about all the stuff I was keeping hidden and repressed because I thought it would freak people out. And then usually I got messages back, Robert, that's actually pretty normal. Robert, there's nothing wrong with you. And I go, you mean I'm not bad? I'm not evil? I'm not this? I'm not that? No, you're, you're, you're normal. <laughs> you're, you're a guy. You're a dude. You know, oh, nobody's ever said, you know, it's okay that I had these sexual thoughts or it's okay that I got angry or it's okay that, you know, these kind of things. So go find safe people coach, 12-step group, therapy group, therapist, and start revealing you. Now, I, I love men's groups for recovering nice guys. I did a lot of my own work early on. I've been in a men's program for years. I've started a men's program, this worldwide men's program. I believe when men can start being vulnerable with other men, we find out we're not alone. We're not terminally unique. This thing that we thought was so fucked up about us, everybody else goes, oh, I do that to you. No, you're not fucked up. You're a good guy. And, and so we got to go do that work, releasing our shame with safe people. That's core. Cool. Other pieces involved connecting with men, because a lot of nice guys I work with are more comfortable seeking female approval than connecting with men, usually because of father issues, you know, not feeling comfortable fitting in with men growing up, maybe being bullied as a kid. But we got to connect with men. And there's luckily nowadays so many places out there. The internet is just filled with men's programs, men's retreats, men's groups. I'm happy. When I started my work, you know, about all there was was, you know, the Robert Bly mythopoetic Iron John movement. We'd go out in the woods and beat a drum and hold a talking stick and say, ho. Oh. that was about all there was. I mean, it was a good start, but that's all there was, right? Look, I'm so glad there's so much more now for men to connect with other men. Okay? Um, being honest. Nice guys tend to think they're pretty honest. They're not. I was not. You know, if I thought anybody's going to be upset at me about anything, I'd leave something out. I wouldn't bring it up. I wouldn't tell them this. I'd shade that part, this part, that. I'd tell out and out lies. I'd make up stories just so nobody ever. So I had to work at really becoming honest, telling the whole truth, not leaving anything out. Again, I think you need safe people to do that with. So, you know, safe people to release your shame, connecting with men, working on being honest. Another really core piece is learning to make your needs a priority. Nice guys use those covert contracts, the give and to get. And, and unfortunately, we tend to surround ourselves with people who are either oblivious to our wants and needs, can't meet our wants and needs, or don't want to meet our wants and needs. We have to start making our wants and needs a priority, both in terms of how we make ourselves a priority and give to ourselves, and surround ourselves with people who want to help us get our needs met. So that's an important part of the process as well. So that's kind of a nutshell, quick, you know, there's many more pieces and nuances, but that's, I, I'd say if I just had to list those off, find safe people, release your shame, connect with men, work on your honesty, make your needs a priority. And let's throw in one more. Learning to soothe yourself because a lot of the nice guy syndrome is around anxiety and how we manage our anxiety. Like I was sucking my thumb, you know, how I seek women's approval, how I don't take risks that might, you know, that would make me anxious. So learning to soothe is a self soothe is a powerful thing in nice guy recovery. So, so there's I think, six things right there. Good stuff. Yeah. One of the things that helps me um, is the knowledge that I have that my friends are the most amazing guys in the world. Truly. Like, I truly mm -hmm. believe in that. That's, that's, uh, that, and you, that you are fortunate. That's, that's I a am powerful thing. super fortunate. Because, and, and, and this is the simple, maybe silly explanation that I give to why 
you know, sometimes when you need to understand why you're a valuable person. Simple paradigm. I have, I love those guys. They're yeah. the best people I know in the world. Yeah. If they like hanging out with me, because for some reason they are, they do like it. Yeah. It probably means that I'm not as bad as I think I am. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not like, great. it's, yeah. So it's, it's one of the things that I think it's so important. That's why I like the fact that you, you, you know, point out how building very powerful relationship with men is, is so crucial wow. for the recovery I'm, process, basically. I'm a believer. I, you know, about six years ago, six, seven years ago, my, my wife and I just got married. I'm living in Mexico. Uh, didn't have any, you know, I'm, I'm, now, I'm no longer living in the gay area of, of town where, I, you know, I can speak. I'm having to speak Spanish. Um, and, you know, I just didn't have any good guy friends. And so I joined a men's program just to connect with, with God. And now every day my friends text me. I'm on Zoom with them. And, you know, I've got 25, 30 guys in my life that all love me and care about me and think I'm an amazing person. And, yeah, that's, that's, that's powerful. That, that'll get you through a lot of stuff. So I'm a big definitely. fan of, of creating those masculine relationships. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I want to ask you about dating. Dating, okay. Yes, uh, because... Well, I guess what what do you think should be what is a good attitude for dating and how you know what let me ask you this. How do you gain confidence with women with dating? <laughs> that's a whole nother podcast, man. I know. That's, 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 but I know. It's like uh <laughs> Well here's here's the thing. I've already kind of given, you know, some of my, you know, nice guy seduction, you know, stuff I would do. You know, repress my sexuality, try to be different from other men, listen to women talk about their problems, do things for them, blah, blah, blah. I thought that'd make women like me and, and, and want to have sex with me. Um, it just usually meant they would just take advantage of whatever I'd do for them, and they'd talk a lot. Um, and, and so... I've, I've often said that my first two wives, who I was married to for a total of 25 years, the two, my first two wives, I should not have dated either one of them more than three dates. But, I mean, the, 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 the reasons were obvious enough at three dates in. But because I was a terrible dater, I didn't have confidence with women. I, 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 I you know, I was a bad ender. You know, once I got a woman, I, I'd just stick with it forever. Uh, you know, I was a nice guy when both of those relationships started. Um, so when I got divorced, when I split 2002 with my second wife, um, and went out kind of, I was, in, I was in my late 40s at that time, and kind of went out and for the first time, was single as an adult, I thought, all right, if I just do what I've always done, I'm gonna get what I've always got. I'm, I'm gonna get the same thing relationship-wise. And I thought it was too much work to get out of this last relationship to just get right back into another one like it. So I realized I had to become a better picker. I had to do a better job of picking the women that, that I, I hung out with. And I had to be a, do a better job being a good ender. And what I soon realized is that dating is a series of making a lot of bad picks. And hopefully you make a lot, uh, you, you, you become a good ender. Because being a good ender can cover a multitude of sins for all those bad picks you're going to make. Because you're going to go on a lot of one and done dates and realize, I don't want to keep seeing this person. And, and so you better be able to stop seeing that person to open the door for other people to come in. Now, in terms of confidence with women, it, it, it's kind of interesting. I, by the time I got out in the dating world in my late 40s and into my 50s, so, you know, like hair going gray, receding hairline, you know, I'm not young anymore. And I was, I was broke at that time coming out of my divorce. So it's not like I had, you know, a lot of money. Um, but I'd worked on a lot of my nice guys. I was no longer, you know, trying so hard to get other people's approval. I wasn't hiding things about me anymore. I was just being me, speaking my truth about who I am, what I want. It's kind of like people can hang out with that or not, you know. And so, and I really had direction and purpose in my life. I, and I loved what I did. Uh, I, I was in th a therapist in private practice at that time. I'd written my book. It was out. I was doing workshops and seminars. Uh, I, I was really learning to enjoy a single lifestyle, going out and listening to music, just living life on my terms. And what was interesting, when I quit seeking approval, quit hiding things about my 
myself, lived life on my terms, got comfortable in my own skin. I didn't have to be confident with women. They were coming to me, which just blew me away. I thought, how come, you know, for most of my life, when I thought, well, women aren't attracted to me, women, you know, uh, don't, you know, they don't like jerks, they want a nice guy, they, blah, blah, blah. And I was doing all my nice guy seduction, you know, I, I often either had went without a girlfriend or like if I got one, I stayed with her way too long. Now here I am not caring about that, living life on my terms, not seeking women. I've never practiced, I've written two books on dating, but I don't practice pickup. I don't walk across a room and talk to her just because I think she's cute or hot or whatever. I didn't have to. I started noticing women were sending me signals, you know, smiling, noticing. People say, Robert, how did you meet your wife? And I said, I was walking down a street in Puerto Vallarta and I heard a voice that said, hola, senor, want a massage? I said, no, and kept walking. I thought, yeah, I liked her voice. I don't even know what she looked like. I turned around, walked back and got a massage and started dating about six months later. We've been married seven years now. So I didn't have to go pursue that. It came to me. So I don't know that I necessarily teach confidence with women. I teach living life on your terms, getting comfortable in your own skin, pursuing your passions. You know, notice when you're seeking approval and validation from others and stop it. You know, seek your own approval and validation. Stop hiding things about you. Be an open book. What you see is what you get. And um, and then I then I also learn to start noticing the signals that women send when they're interested, which is a whole whole nother nice guy thing is that nice guys have a I, I did have a hard time recognizing women's signals of interest. They're often subtle. They don't want to have to be the aggressor in general. They don't want to have to put up a billboard that says, ask me for my number, stupid. They, you know, they, they, they'll do everything under the sun, you know, to, to make it easy for us to, you know, respond. And again, most nice guys don't. They're afraid of looking foolish, making a mistake. Maybe I got it wrong, blah, 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 blah. And so we don't do anything. So it's not even a matter of getting confident. I don't, I don't know that I'm still confident with women. You know, they still scare me. Um, but I don't seek their approval anymore, and I don't chase them, and I don't chase beauty, and, and I never did. Um, and so when it comes to me, I get to be the decider. I'm the picker. Do I want to walk through that open door or not? Or you just stick my head in and look around. But when you pick up, is you go pound on a lot of closed doors, hoping maybe you do the right pickup line, the right hypnosis, the right trick, you know, the right, right peacocking, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll open the door. And, and you know, give you a digit, yeah, big deal. So again, I don't, I don't so much preach confidence. Now, what I do say that if a man looks comfortable in his own skin, if he looks like you know, hey, I, I, I like me, I'm okay with you know with me, I'm going in a direction I like, it triggers the exact same brain chemicals in a woman's brain that the guy would experience if she lifted her shirt and showed him her breasts. It's just wired into it. That the, the feminine is attracted to that kind of strength and confidence and self-assurance, just like men are attracted to breasts. You know, there's, there's no difference in terms of the chemical reaction. The woman, you know, doesn't have to think, do I like that? She just knows she does. We don't have to think, do I like that? We just do. And, and so it's, we can just go with what's natural rather than trying to, oh, if I just get confident with women, then I'll have success. Because you can get me going on that one. Because then the guys will come up with this negative feedback loop. Well, if I don't have confidence, I can't be successful with women. And I can't get confidence until I'm successful with women. So there's no way. So I'm going to stay home and, you know, masturbate to porn and never even talk to them. So I, I, I take confidence completely out of the equation. But I guess that the confidence is something that comes in once you have, you know, become the integrated man that you describe once that you once you are integrated with yourself it projects this confidence that you talk about so you don't need to think about it that much and again you know if we go back to something i said and i don't think i'd ever said it quite the way i said it to you on this call that there's no such thing as feminine approval i don't think i'd ever said that exactly like that right. but there is such a thing as there you go. You got it. Really, I, I, that's why I like doing you know like interviews yeah. like this because stuff just comes out of me. Go, wow! Yeah. I, I didn't see that coming. But there is such a thing as masculine because because masculine is about structure 
and it is about being masterful, and it is about if you if, you know if you do line up the pieces right, the machine will run. And it's not so much about getting the applause or you know you know doing the, the end zone dance. You just did it well. You you know you did it well, and everybody else can see you did it well. It's internally validated. That to me is confidence, and I think that is highly attractive to the feminine. Mm-hmm. External validation is a feminine trait. So if we're seeking women's approval of us. We're never going to get confident. It's just never going to happen. And we're never going to consistently get women to approve of us. I mean, again, I've been married over 30 years. I don't think any of my wives have ever consistently approved of me over time. It's yeah. kind of like one day they do, one day they don't. One minute they do, one minute they don't. My guy friends aren't like that. They, they, yeah. They're not liking me one minute, disapproving me of the next. Yeah, that's really interesting and such a, such a good point. Uh, I do want to ask you because I asked you that uh, in the email before if you can give an example of the integrated man and a book that you would recommend, except I, I, of I, course I, from your book. I, except I wrote some stuff down. You know, actually when I read your email and said you know some movies, some books, that that gave me more panic than almost anything. And I've been asked. Really, that question I'm before. sorry. <laughs> that, so well, part of the problem is I, I haven't. I, I rarely watch movies or television anymore. <laughs> I just, I just don't. It's not that I'm against it, or you know, I just don't. So most movies I know, or TV shows I know, are like old. But I did come up with some stuff, and and one of the things I guess the main thought that came to me in terms of what does an integrated man look like in books or movies is it's never that he's a perfect man. He's often flawed, but but yet in spite of his flaws, he seems to have a core integrity about him that that he's true to, that he comes back to. The one example would be Odysseus in the Odyssey. He was a flawed motherfucker, but but you know, thinking about him taunting the Cyclops, you know, and you know, it, 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 you know things like that. But he he also had the, the the core values about him. So so some movies. I I I saw Kevin Spacey in American Beauty when I was like just doing my deepest nice guy work. That are, he was flawed, but yet he just you know he said I'm. I'm just an ordinary guy with nothing to lose. That's integrity, right? You can argue that he actually did the process of moving from being a nice guy into an integrated yeah. man during the movie. That's a, I yeah. never thought about it. Great example. Great. I like that example. Tyler Durden in Fight Club might be another example. Oh yeah, yeah. He's on his own terms, but I, and I list that as a book that I think every guy should read. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Palahniuk's Fight Club. Right. Uh, the Three Hundred. You know, the, uh-huh. I can't remember the, 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 the protagonist, um, main person. Forgot his name. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, that certain, that core integrity. Schindler's List came to mind. Of uh-huh. Somebody that operated with integrity. Captain Picard from Star Trek Next Generation. Okay. I, I, I always liked that, that character. And women <laughs> really always liked it as well. All right. Some of my favorite books. All-time favorite fiction book, Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Mm. Love, love that book, and it's it's just about it's about all about masculinity. Um, Count of Monte Cristo, uh, uh-huh. another yeah, really great. Good book. love that book. I already mentioned Fight Club, um, The Odyssey. A couple of books, uh, nonfiction would be The Way of the Superior Man by David Data. Uh, okay. A lot of a lot of men, you know, are familiar with that. But Way of the Superior Man. Another one of my favorite books is called Passionate Marriage. By Dr. David Snarch, uh, really, really good book uh, about reading. So mm. there you go. That, that, that's uh, that's uh, awesome. That's like said, that's you, great. You put me, you put me in anxiety. Oh no, um, I have to think of somebody from a movie. I'm sorry. I I I just uh, no. I'm sorry if I if I put you in. If it's, I a some anxiety. it's a great but, uh, question. It's a great question. Yeah, but because it's it's okay to have anxiety. <laughs> I want just one. We have one minute, so I just want to tell you this. I started reading your book from a recommendation of a friend when I was studying for the California bar 10 or f- a week before the test and I was so focused such a schedule so intense and I opened you I made the mistake of opening your book and I could not stop reading it and I instead of going to bed at like 10 I went to bed at 12 because I just couldn't fall asleep I by the way I passed the bar so it's all good, good. but good. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take but, credit for it even yeah but I just that just wanted to illustrate how important and impactful this book was. So I really am super grateful for you 
for writing it and also for coming and talking to me because it was great and super, super interesting conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. I thoroughly of enjoyed course. it. And uh, I'll look forward if we have the opportunity to do it again. Maybe we'll talk about dating. Yeah, I would love to. Excellent. All okay. right, Eddie. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll bump into each other again.